This is the first of several short lectures about concurrent medical disorders affecting pregnancy. When a woman enters a pregnancy, any chronic condition or conditions that affect her health do not go away. Some may improve in terms of the active symptoms, for instance, rheumatic disorders. They feel a lot better in pregnancy. Why? Because they're immunosuppressed. And others may worsen, as in heart disease. We're going to be talking about that. Some of the disorders that are controlled by medications may need to be adjusted because the medications have the potential to cause harm to the fetus. Things like antihypertensive agents, like the ACE inhibitors, and many of the SSRIs that we use to control hypertension. The medical disorders that are concurrent with pregnancy can adversely affect the mother, the fetus, or both. Heart disease affects both. Anemia affects both due to the oxygenation issues. The immune complex disorders may affect the mother, but they don't affect the baby. But the bottom line is, the more controlled the medical conditions are at the start of the pregnancy, the better the outcome. This is another reason why preconception planning is so important. There are also acute medical conditions that can cause harm to the fetus, such as the torch viruses, beta hemolytic strep, and anemia. Be sure to watch the Khan Academy video regarding blood conditions in pregnancy. We're going to begin with heart disease. It may affect pregnancy and is definitely affected by pregnancy due to the increased vascular volume which peaks during the late second trimester as well as the stress of labor. Pregnancy is already considered to be a hypercoagulable state. Couple this with existing heart disease and the risk of adverse event due to clotting becomes high. The heart conditions may be congenital in nature and due to the advances in cardiac surgery, these defects are repaired when these women were very young and now they are surviving, maturing, and having babies. 20 years ago, this was not an issue, but now it is. Rheumatic heart disease, which is a result of a strep infection that eventually adversely affected the heart valves, is most common in immigrants who grew up in third world countries that have poor medical care. So they had a strep infection and they didn't have antibiotics to treat it. And the strep seeded itself on the valves. The risk factors attributed to complications from cardiac disease include having a previous history of a cardiac event, the heart is damaged due to congestive heart failure, there can be a presence of a dysrhythmia, or the patient might have a history of a TIA, stroke, or an MI. Patients categorized as class 3 or 4 by the New York Heart Association, both of which have physical impairment due to the cardiac symptoms prior to pregnancy, do very poorly throughout pregnancy and labor because of the added blood volume. If a patient has an ejection fraction of less than 40%, there is a high risk of a poor outcome and development of CHF during the pregnancy, through delivery, as well as into the postpartum period. The same holds true for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we're seeing more and more often. Stenotic mitral or aortic, aortic valvular disease also can cause congestive heart failure. The clinical manifestations that we need to be on alert for are going to be shortness of breath with activity, and of course, if it is present without activity, you know that this patient is in more trouble. Fatigue, beyond what is usually expected during pregnancy. When you auscultate the heart, do they now have a pathologic heart murmur? the S3 or S4, 
And remember, these are best elicited with the patient lying on their left side. The patient may develop palpitations. And then the signs of worsening congestive heart failure is the same if it's an adult that's not pregnant, if it's in a child, if it's in a baby, if we start having coarse crackles or ronchi when we're auscultating the lungs. Is this woman complaining not only of shortness of breath, but also has a moist cough? This can be a sign of a worsening cardiac condition. And then we look for edema. Now edema is very common as pregnancy progresses, but is the extent of this edema worse than what we would expect at this particular gestational age? When you look at this slide, and you can see that this came from the European Heart Association, when a woman is pregnant and they have a congenital heart disease, it is a multidisciplinary team that needs to be called upon to take care of this woman throughout the pregnancy, the delivery, and in the postpartum period. So you can just see all the people that we're going to be calling. Anesthesia definitely needs to be in the mix here. When this woman gets admitted and we're calling for pain relief, anesthesia needs to know how much fluid can they give to this patient, what medications are they on, etc. And most of the time these women are going to be seen by a high risk perinatologist slash obstetrician. And some of these perinatologists do deliver the patients. So what are our nursing interventions? We need to educate this, this patient throughout the pregnancy. They need to be active, yet limit activity to the extent that if they have shortness of breath, palpitations, when they start walking up a hill, well, instead of walking up the hill, they need to walk on a flat surface. We really need to counsel them about their diet because we do not want them gaining the 50, 60, or 70 pounds that some women will do just because they are pregnant. We talk to them not only about the calories, but how much salt do they have in their diet. And this is going to include some beverages that may have salt. We want to prevent an anemia. And so we'll do this by uh, discussing the iron-rich foods in their diet. So red meat, all of the dark green leafy vegetables, uh, potatoes. So you should have a pretty good idea of what foods are high in iron. And we talk to the patient about this. We screen them on the initial prenatal visit like anybody else. Do they have an existing anemia? And we start them on oral iron so that they don't get that mid-trimester drop in the hemoglobin. We also want them to try and avoid getting any type of illness. Viral gastroenteritis comes around. We don't want them to get it because they're already difficult enough to manage being as healthy as possible while they're pregnant, and then we add another illness on top of it, it just complicates the whole management. And it'll end up having the patient be admitted. She's not in labor, but we're going to take care of her because she's pregnant and nobody else in the hospital would take care of a pregnant woman. They see that pregnant belly and it's automatic go to labor and delivery. That's why we have an antepartum floor. So other things that we need to think about is what do we do with this patient when they're in labor? We're going to put them on strict INO. Most women in labor, we just hang an IV and it, when the bag's empty, we put up another one and then, okay, did she pee yet? No, well, let's put her on a bedpan, let's put in a Foley. Not this lady. We are going to really watch how much fluids we are going to give her to avoid that fluid overload. Medications. Are we going to be administering medications to this patient? And if so, what? So be unprepared to administer diuretics. We also may give digoxin. Both of these are to reduce circulating volume and increase cardiac muscle contractility, therefore increasing their, her cardiac output. This patient may be placed on a cardiac monitor. We want to keep the environment as calm and quiet as possible to reduce the effect of adrenaline when stressed. When we are chaotic, in a room that really stresses out a mother. A woman, a woman with a cardiac condition, we don't want that to happen to. 
She may re receive an epidural earlier than expected. If she's going to have a vaginal birth, we want to have minimal pushing, and that is the preferred method of delivery. Now, to reduce the pushing, we want her to get that baby down low enough that we can do an assisted extraction with a vacuum or forceps, and that decreases the need for her to push. Some women with heart disease may be put on anticoagulants, such as Lovenox, during pregnancy. At least 24 hours prior to labor or a scheduled C-section, the patient will be switched from Lovenox to heparin, which is shorter acting. Neither of these drugs go through the placenta because they're such large molecules. Your job will be to monitor the PT, PTT, and INR when the patient is on heparin. Continue to monitor this patient for congestive heart failure. Remember, once that placenta detaches, there is at least a 500 milliliter volume of blood that enters into the maternal circulation. And this is enough to tip a woman who was somewhat stable into CHF. Maintain the same calm, quiet environment. Reposition the patient carefully. Be slow to ambulate the patient. Have her dangle at the bedside to avoid strain on the heart. And this ends part one of concurrent disorders in pregnancy.